It's such a blessing to come into this pulpit already on a mountain. Yeah. That's a blessing. Very thankful. God speaks to his people in a variety of ways. God doesn't just have one way he talks to his people. Some people can't conceive of God saying anything negative to his people or providing a word of warning to his people. You remember when that Smiling Jesus movie came out a while back, you know, and he just smiled at everything he said, he just smiled, smiled, smiled. And, you know, and I'm not interested in the emotionless Jesus, but I think we had a little bit of an overreaction there, and so he's wrapping off these strong words, these serious words about taking the plank out of your eye, and he's making a kind of a joke about it, because there are certain people that can't conceive of God saying hard things and giving words of warning. Like this. this, these are the words of Jesus here. Fear not them which that can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. God can say some hard things, and Jesus can say some hard things. How about this one? Sometimes God gives words of warning, and the warning is like really short. Like this. Remember Lot's wife. That's a word of warning. You remember Lot's wife got out of Sodom, but she didn't get in to Zoar. You suppose that kind of thing could happen? But now, God doesn't only say negative things either. And there are some people, when they talk about God, they can't conceive of him comforting and encouraging his people. Some people, as they say, or they seem as if they're kind of baptized in vinegar and weaned on a dill pickle. Have you heard people talk like that? Seems like they're that way. Everything they say is, a, is negative. And, but there are some comforting things that God, that God says to his people. I liked this one. Fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I was working in Arkansas um, this last week, and I happened to come off of the exit from a highway and came down to the stoplight, and I saw this sign that said, Little Flock. That was comforting. When your mind is set upon the gospel of Christ, you will be amazed at how many things God will put around you that will provoke your consideration of that gospel. Amen. That's like a truth that's kind of come home to me more lately. That's... Where is the spirit of your mind, brethren? What controls your mind? What's your focus? Something very important to consider. The reason why I say these things, and there are a number of other comforting words, since the brethren said so many comforting words already, I'll just stop with that, but is because the text before us is both a word of comfort and encouragement mingled with a word of admonition, a gentle warning. Both of those things are said in one word. And I'm glad God can speak like this. He can comfort you and at the same time leave you with a sober mind carefully considering the dangers that are about you, okay? Now, the disciples were certainly in need of comfort and encouragement at this time. You may recall that this is the occasion of the Last Supper, and there are a number of things that Jesus did and said at the Last Supper that the disciples didn't really understand. And ignorance can be a great discomforter to you, especially when God is speaking. And maybe you don't understand all the things that are associated with what he has said. That can be a source of great discomfort. And there were a number of things that were happening and things being said here that they just didn't understand at this time. They would, but they hadn't. And so they were in need of comfort. More than that, there was in the 13th chapter the announcement of a betrayer. Not a betrayer outside of this, this small group, but a betrayer within the group. I mean, you can imagine Jesus coming into our assembly and saying this, there is one of you that is not clean. That was a surreal experience for these disciples at that time. 
one of you shall betray me. And he didn't tell him who it was. And remember, they began to look one on another. And they were saying to themselves, is it I? Is it I? Well, that would be a source of great discomfort. To know that there was somebody among us that isn't going to be faithful to Jesus. And is going to be a betrayer. And so these disciples, for that reason, were in need of great comfort. The thing is, how was Jesus going to comfort him? this group of disciples. How would he comfort them? The way that you best comfort a believer is by turning their attention to the Savior himself. In the midst of a number of things which they didn't really understand, things over which they really didn't have any control, it was good for them to be looking to the one who did have the control. And so Jesus said to them, you believe in God, believe also in me. In other words, you believe on me just like you have believed on God to that degree. And then he says, in my father's house there are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, has he gone? Yes, he's gone. Well, this is how we reason. If I go, then I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may also be. Now, there's something already to be seen in that that is so good. If you're going to comfort the people of God, you show them the working Jesus. You show them Jesus in active involvement in the work of God. I'm going to go. I'm going to prepare. I'm going to come back. That's how you comfort the people of God. As you know, Jesus is not idle. He said, the Father work and I work. And that's what we're being shown here. We're We're being shown... A Jesus who is actively working in salvation. And all the things that he's talking about are critical matters. The text before us, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. That is like a very critical matter. And the thing that the disciples needed to see, and they did not fully understand at this time, but they would, is the central role Jesus plays in the work of salvation. And that is something that we need to continually understand and see now more than comfort they needed an admonition they needed a gentle warning here because when Jesus says no man comes to the Father but by me there's a warning in that there's a warning you see there is a danger brethren of being distracted from God there is a great danger of that happening Okay, let me give you some examples of this actually happening in Scripture. For example, how about Moses? When God had told him, and he had brought those people down into the wilderness of sin, and there was no water there, and those people began to complain and grumble against Moses over this whole matter. And they provoked him and provoked him and provoked him. Remember, God told him this time, here's how you get water out of the rock. You speak to it. And he didn't speak to it, did he? He struck the rock, and he struck it twice when God had told him to speak to it. Do you suppose salvation can be on that kind of a detailed level? When God tells you something? Like when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Do you suppose there will be people that will come to God in the day of judgment looking to enter in and will not be able to because they despised that specific word? Mm -hmm. And Jesus will say to them, you did not remember what I said, and you are out. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. This is like very serious. And so Moses was not able to enter into the promised land because of that. Of course, you know, he was provoked by the people, and we'd all be provoked too. Yeah. But when God sets forth a protocol that has to do with God's service, mm-hmm. we've got to remember it. Yes. Got to remember it. He was distracted by anger, and if you're not careful, you can be distracted by anger too. Okay? We all have this... The same flesh. We all are of men of like passions, like I said of, of Elijah. King Saul, care distracted him 
from the Lord. There the Philistines were gathering in masses and thousands of chariots and thousands of horsemen. There they were gathering together to battle against Israel. And the people of Israel knew they didn't have any advantage. They didn't have conventional weapons of war and these kind of things. And the people began to scatter. Remember, they began to scatter into caves and things, and they were scattering away from Saul. And Saul knew this was a bad thing. But more than that, you may recall that Samuel was not there yet. He had tarried. And you remember what Saul did. He went ahead and skipped the protocol and offered a sacrifice as a king. And right after he had made that offering, Samuel showed up and said, The kingdom is rent from your hand because of that. Yes, brother, now we understand exactly why it is written to be careful for nothing. Because care can distract you from God. Beyond that, Peter also had a time of distraction. There he was. Now, we're not going to be too critical of Peter because Peter did. I love the way the scripture says it. When he got out of the boat to go to Jesus, the scripture says that he essayed to go to Jesus. Well, that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And, and, and you know that at this time, it wasn't like a calm sea. It was like, it would like be hard to paint the right picture without the waves of water just covering the entire picture, you know? I don't think there's enough restlessness in some of the seas that people paint of what was happening here. The wind and the waves were boisterous. They were very violent and very strong. That's the water that Peter was walking out to go to Jesus, but unfortunately, he took his eyes off Jesus and set him on the wind and the waves, and he began to sink at that point. Fear can distract you from the Savior. You see, brethren, this is the context in which the Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's like Jesus is saying this, Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved, for I am God and there is none else. That's, that's like what he's saying here. But it was a, there's a word of warning in this. Now, in salvation, there is a great danger of being distracted from beholding the central role of Jesus in every aspect of the work of salvation. I go to prepare a place for you. And so Thomas responds, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? And there is that danger of somehow not being able to make the hard connection between some critical aspect of salvation and Jesus' role in that. This has happened to the Galatians. Remember when they wanted to add circumcision? Maybe men would have thought that would, that would seem pretty harmless. I mean, this is a, something prescribed in the Bible. It was a holy work. It wasn't like they were, you know, falling off into immorality or something like that. And it seemed pretty good. But now when Paul addressed them, he said this, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that has called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. That little addition was that serious. They were removed from him. That's serious, brother. Maybe some of the fruitlessness that's happening today is a result of somebody has added something yeah. and they really have been removed from him. Hmm. Now, there are, I know that there are some men say that that can't happen, but I could care less what they say. This is the word of God, and I'm not ashamed of it. You are removed from him, and you have fallen from grace. That's how serious that was. And so that's the admonition here. Because there are invariably going to be men who are going to try to come to God by something other than by Jesus. And they are not going to make it. He's the only way. See, and we see that not only in Galatians, we see that happening in the Colossians with human wisdom. We see that in a number of the churches that were addressed in the book of Revelation. How could they possibly be in that state? The only way they could be is their eyes have been drawn away from Jesus to something else. You cannot remain in an unacceptable state before God with your eyes set on the Son of God. This can't happen. You have to be turned away. And so... It's my business this morning just to affirm the centrality of Jesus Christ in the work of salvation as addressed by this text. I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No man cometh to the Father but by me. Now, you know, all the I am's that we find in the scriptures, they all relate to central matters in salvation. Every one of them. Every one of them. For example, Jesus says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. Well, isn't that the promise that God has promised us? Even everlasting life? I mean, is there some man you can go to in the world that can give you life everlasting? That's pretty critical. Or how about this one? I am the door. By me, if any man enter in. That's a good word. Because the ones that are without are dogs. You know, in the day of judgment, when God comes, when Jesus comes and the glory of God is revealed, the only ones that are going to be subject to the wrath of God are those that do not know God. They're the only ones. And don't obey the gospel. See? This entering in business, that's important. Entering in. He shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So if you've found pasture, and you know how important it is to find pasture as a sheep, then Jesus is the one that led you to find pasture. Everybody that's found pastures, has been fed, has come through the door, because it's the only way you can get it, see? We can see by this, and I've said this over and over, but let me say it over and over. Everything Jesus does, only Jesus does. Yeah, amen. That's why he's so indispensable in the work of salvation. No angel does what Jesus does. Even the very role that Jesus plays, God the Father doesn't play. There are things that Jesus does that only Jesus does. And all those I am's of the Bible have to do that, have to do with that. And if you set your mind to really meditate on the I am's, that comes across very strongly. And pretty soon, you're unwilling to put your trust in anybody else, not even the sweetest frame but to wholly lean on Jesus' name because his role is so vital. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Is fruitfulness important? Yes. This is a big part of the design of salvation is that God gets a fruit from a people in whom he's working. Hey, a fruitless people doesn't bring honor and glory to God. I don't care how much men dignify fruitlessness, and they do try to do it. But it cannot be dignified. It cannot be dignified. No, he is, brethren, he has made us for his own glory and for his own name, and he is going to get a fruit from a people that are dwelling with Christ Jesus. Which, by the way, while I'm on this point, I've got this later, but I want to say this right now. God will not receive from you any kind of fruit that Jesus has not produced in you. And if you ever try and bring something to God that has not been the product of Jesus working in you, he will not receive it. Okay, now let me say that in a positive way, because I don't mean to be negative. We have been married to another in order that we might bring fruit unto God. And as long as you are abiding with Christ, Christ will make you fruitful. He'll make you fruitful. That's a marvelous comfort for the people of God. He'll make you fruitful. That's a good truth to see. He is the vine. Or how about this one? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I'll show you this here a little bit later. But the central role of a sacrifice, someone laying their life down, that was such a central part of redemption. All those sacrifices offered, what were every one of those sacrifices saying in a single message? If you're going to come to God, you have to come by the blood of one who died. Or you're not going to get there. That's what that's all about. And so he is the good shepherd. Part of his good shepherding, lay your life down for the sheep. Amen. And he did that. By the way, when a lot of hirelings were fleeing, <laughs> fleeing away. That's how you know hirelings, brother. And when things get difficult, the hirelings get going. That's, that's how hirelings are. They don't care for the sheep. But Jesus does. And so we see all, in all of this the centrality of Jesus' role in the work of salvation. And there are a number of others like this, but I won't, I won't get to all of them. There is no aspect of the work of salvation over which Jesus does not have a very present and central role. Even the things that you do 
You do it because it becomes the product of God working in you, both the will and do of his own good pleasure. And if it's God's not working in you, and if you're working independent of his fellowship from you, you will not be able to do it. I mean, that kind of removes boasting from us and gives it back to God where it belongs. Not that I'm saying we do nothing. We do nothing. I'm not saying that. We do of the overflow of his doing in us and through our fellowship with him or it doesn't get done. See, that's, that's so important. And that doesn't mean, brother, and I hate that we even have to give these, all these disclaimers. That doesn't mean we're sitting back with our hands folded waiting for God to do and then we'll do. It's, it's not that kind of thing. But when you put your hand, when you put your foot into the water, it'll part. And you'll be able to do what God's told you to do. I and mean, he's told you to go forward, go forward, the water will part. Believe me. It works that way. That's how God works. Okay? If salvation was a remedy, then Jesus is the active ingredient. Yeah, uh -huh. Think of it that way. And salvation is a remedy, right? Some people have called the gospel a gospel pill. It's the best pill out there is the gospel pill. But Jesus is the active ingredient in the pill. When you go to the pharmacy, you're looking for that active ingredient because if you take the active ingredient out, all you got is filler for the belly. Yeah. That's just the way it is. And that's what you have without Jesus. You got a bunch of activity, but nothing God will receive. He's, he's the active ingredient. And if the work of salvation, if the work of salvation were a screenplay, then Jesus plays the star role. Okay? Jesus is never an assisting actor. Amen. Never. But if you're not careful, in your mind, you'll begin to think that way. Your responsibility to God, if you are not careful, will loom larger than Jesus' responsibility to God. And you will not be able to keep the faith like that. I don't care who you are. He is the, he's the star role. Okay? Everything he does is absolutely essential. When it comes to the way, the truth, and the life, it is all dispensed through him. Or it's not dispensed. So important that, that we see that. You know, there are a number of comprehensive views of salvation that we find in the scripture. And we find them attributed to God. I hope that's not too general to say that. But let me just, let me give you an example. Here we've come around the time of Christmas. And so we've come back to the time when, when, they, bring, uh, when they bring the child Jesus in uh, according to the law. And then Simeon comes up. And remember, he takes up the child into his arms and he says... Now letteth thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now listen, think about this. You're a branch, but he's the root. Okay? You've got a role, but he's got a role. You know what I mean? Tell me, what aspect of salvation is there that Jesus is not prominently in? To make it effective. I mean, if it comes just to putting away sin, then he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. If it comes to the work of righteousness, well, this is the king that reigns in righteousness. And he is the Lord, our righteousness. And he's the preeminent one in the work of righteousness so that princes can rule in judgment. He's the righteous one, see? When it comes to the need for life from the dead, and by the way, <laughs> that's, how it's, that's how it is in salvation. He doesn't start with nothing and come from dust and make you into something. He, he starts with dead people. But Jesus is the resurrection. And he has the key of hell and death and he can just unlock. If you have need for your feet not to stumble, he's the light. And you won't stumble while you're walking in light. See, there is no aspect of salvation over which Jesus doesn't play a critical role. So we can look at Jesus and we can say, thy salvation. And you've not overstated the case. He is just that. In other words, everything that God intends to do in salvation is accomplished through Christ and your faith in him. And if you keep your faith in him, everything that God has said he will do that falls under the parameters of salvation is going to be accomplished. That's thy salvation. I like to think about that. There are a number of other comprehensive views of salvation like this. For example, when John opens the letter to 1 John, he says this in the second verse of the first chapter, the life was manifest and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Yeah. It's not an over-exaggeration. He is that eternal life. I mean, what aspect of being given eternal life is Jesus not prominently in? 
And so I don't have time to break that one down, but that's, that's attributed to Jesus. I mean, that's, that's, that's something for meditation. That's like see law. Consider that. He is that eternal life, which was with the Father made known to us. That's, that's quite a truth. And what we're coming down to here is this, is that Jesus is the only means of coming to God, which is what salvation is all about. I'm afraid that men have been distracted in our age. Some men, they think more about, and don't get me wrong by saying this, okay? I, I hope you don't. I've asked, help me, Lord, not to speak so that people have a wrong understanding of what I'm trying to say here. Some men think more about the way a person is baptized in water than they realize and think about the one the person is being baptized into. Now, is obedience to the form of the doctrine essential? You bet it is. You bet it is. And it's essential to obey from the heart the form of the doctrine. You bet that's critical. But the most essential thing is that they are joined to Christ. And you just don't hear a lot of press about that, do you? No. At least I, I haven't heard a lot about it. People are being distracted from what is most essential about salvation. It's astounding that a person is reported to be a believer but has no hunger to walk in fellowship with God. I mean, how can that even possibly be? Salvation is about coming to God. In fact, if you're not interested in coming to God, you really don't have any interest in Jesus because that's what he's doing. You can think of coming to God in a, multi, multi, a, a couple of different ways. You know, we talked about some of these ways this morning, but justification, reconciliation. There was a time, brethren, when we did just like the prodigal son. We, we kind of, the Lord caused for us to kind of come to our senses, and we said, I'm going to go to my father. I'm going to him. But the only reason you got there, and the only reason you got the ring and the coat and the fatted calf, the only reason you got that is because Jesus was between there is no reconciliation without him. But now, brother, even now we're continually going to God, aren't we? I mean, we don't have to presuppose alienation when we think about coming to the Father, do we? And so this text in John 14, 6 goes way beyond just your entrance, just conversion. We're still going to the Father. In fact, we come, the Bible says, come to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need we're like in this in this area of sanctification we're like continually going to the father <laughs> we're continually doing that but you got to have jesus between to do it you still have to have him to do it and then of course glorification is a view of coming to the father it's like the ultimate coming to god when god will dwell with these people and they will be his people and he will be their god but Jesus is going to be the one to make sure that happens. So in, in whatever way you're looking at that, Jesus is central in, in that coming. Okay? Now, I, I thought, and I wrestled with this, how, how to bring this truth across, and it finally kind of came to me, and I hope, I hope this will be edifying to you. I know it was very edifying for me to consider. It was a marvelous thing to consider. But I took this text, and I just put it over the Levitical system. Because the Levitical system represents a way of coming to God. That's what it is. Okay? When God set up this tabernacle, this, me this tent of meaning, you may recall that he set it up in the center of the camp. And all of the tribes were dispersed in relation to that tabernacle, which was in the center. I mean, he didn't, the tabernacle wasn't put off to the edge and all the people in the middle. That's kind of the way salvation is today. They got all the people in the middle and the tabernacle off on the edge. But that's not how it is at all, is it? No, that's not how salvation is at all. It's the tent of meeting which was in the center. And the people were around the tent, see? And you may recall that there was an intricate Levitical, uh, intricate system of coming to God, which involved dealing with sin, which involved the people being able to receive from God, which involved the people being able to give back to God. All those things are involved in coming to God and having life from God. But it was all pictured in that system, okay? Now, if there's one thing, and these are just things I gleaned from looking at, at the way that system worked, if there's one thing we learn about that Levitical system is that there is a divine protocol for coming to God. Mm -hmm. You cannot just come however you want to come. 
So well, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go out into the wilderness, and that's where I'm going to find God today. And I'm not going to come to the priest, and I'm not going to come by blood or by a sacrifice, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to do all that. Well, then you just didn't find God. That's the way it works. There are a lot of people that have this kind of notion that, you know, there's a lot of ways that that lead to God. Really? Are there really? There's only one way that I know of. See, God's got a protocol for coming to God, and if you do not come the way God says to come, you don't get there. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And we see that in that Levitical system as, as, it, was, as it was worked out. Now, I'm just going to take you through the various aspects of that, of that system and what you saw inside of there, okay? And you'll see exactly where I'm going when I say these things. One of the first things you were confronted with when you came to that outside tent of meeting, see that large curtain that was around there, you would be confronted with a priest who would take your offering, of course, because no other person was allowed to come into that court area. The priests and the high priest. They were the ones that were allowed to be in that area, okay, which itself is a marvelous picture. And the priest was a man, which tells you something about coming to God and about salvation, that if you're going to come to God, you have to come through a man. You couldn't go in there and make your own offering, do your own thing, especially on the Day of Atonement. This became so abundantly clear. When one man did everything that was associated with the Day of Atonement, see? And you were on the outside while he was carrying those things out, making the offering, going in, presenting the offering to the Lord. But that tells you something about salvation. It's what this man has done. That is so essential when it comes to coming to God. It's what this high priest has done. The truth of the matter is that there is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And you saw that in that system. If you were going to come to God, you came through a man. Now, if you got inside that courtyard area, one of the first things that may capture your attention is that altar. That bronze altar and all of the various type of sacrifices that were offered upon that bronze altar and what a marvelous picture that is of coming coming to the living God because you can't come to God without a sacrifice you can't there's got to be a sacrifice which means there's got to be an offering of life in death it's got to be okay you just you can't sidestep that it's astounding that we live in a day where the cross is kind of being sidestepped mm -hmm. yeah. doesn't work that way Amen. you come to God through a sacrifice. So the words of Isaiah, I think, give such a marvelous depiction of what this blood was all about. I know Brother Jason has, has often said this, that he didn't just open a vein, you know, and just pour out a little bit of blood or take the offering and whack off the leg and you get the offering back and, you know, then that's, that would be a good offering. No, it wasn't like that at all. It wasn't like that at all. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death. Amen. Unto death. And that's what you see when you go to that altar. You see that, a death. There is a very good reason, brethren, why we come every Sunday to remember the Lord's death. Because if you're going to have any confidence continually in coming before God, the truth of the death of Jesus is something that's got to continue to be large in your thinking. And in all of your service of God, it's got to be large, okay? Or else you don't come to God. It'd be like trying to sidestep the altar in order to come to God, and you would just die. That's just, that's just how it would happen, okay? Now, if you go beyond that altar, you would see a labor of washing. And the priests would wash in this labor before they would enter into their service inside the, inside the tabernacle area, which was so important because if... And this is something that is not known today. If you've heard people talk, some of the ways that people talk make you wonder, and you're serving God, and at the same time you're involved in this, and you're astounded because this isn't widely known. This isn't widely known, but if you're going to come to God, you've got to come clean. Yeah. You can't yeah. come defiled. You can't serve God defiled. You can't. You've got to be clean. And we see that. You know, I love, I love the way that Paul addressed the saints of God. He was very particular in how he spoke to them. 
You know, he talked about a number of sins and things that the believers at Corinth had been delivered from and some things that they had passed through. And then he said this, and what a blessing it is. Such were some of you. That's what you were. See, the labor of washing stood between what you were before you came into Christ and what you now are. <laughs> You're clean. Such were some of you, he says, but ye are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit mm -hmm. of our God. See, he is that labor of washing. Mm -hmm. Now, if you went beyond that, you would go into this, the holy place area, you would see a table with bread on it, 12, 12 loaves of bread representing all the tribes of Israel. I mean, there is a propitiation for the whole world. Some people don't like that truth, but that has to be known. It has to be demonstrated that grace is greater than sin, and it has been. I know you see that. Showbread. Showbread. God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, and raised us up together, and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. Why is that so essential? Because of this. God will not commune with a dead person. He won't do it. And if you're going to commune with God, you have to commune through the life which God gives. Or there isn't going to be any fellowship. That's just the way it works. You know this is the case. If you have ever, if you have ever wandered away from Christ and you find yourself becoming dull, there's less fellowship with God. Why? Because death is gaining more control. You come to God and are walking in fellowship with God and serve God through the life which he has supplied. In other words, the more that you lay hold on eternal life, the more fellowship you will have with God and the more service you will offer to him. That's, that's the way it works. And Jesus is that bread. Jesus said, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Hey, maybe you have existence in Adam, but you don't have life. Existence isn't enough to walk with God. It's got to be through life, the life which he has supplied. And we see that when we look at the table that's on there. I, I hope these things encourage your heart. This is the only way that I, could, that I could conceive for myself of being able to get at this text. You have the candle of light. Now, brother, think of this. Coming to God is... is It's about serving God, but it's about serving God through communion and fellowship with God. Amen. It's not just that we're offering to God, although we are not really conscious of God and thinking about God. This is how I was taught in Babylon. We were taught systems and precepts. Maybe they weren't apparently bad of themselves. The problem I had with them is they turned my trust and my attention away from Jesus so that I would attempt to give myself to some kind of service of God, but I didn't have God conscionably in my heart and mind when I was doing it. I was more focused on a precept, a system, and a, a way, kind of that kind of a thing. But how contrary that is in your service to God. You serve God through the knowledge of God. Not head knowledge of God, heart knowledge and fellowship with God, or else you can't serve God. And the only way... The only way God can be known is through the light that shines forth from Jesus Christ. That's the only way God can be known. God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Which means what? The more your face is steadfastly fixed on the Son of God, the more you will know about God and be in fellowship with him. See, he's that candelabra that's in there. Yeah. And that light was always burning when they were serving. That's right. You have to have light to serve. No man cometh to the Father mm -hmm. but by me. Every day, brother, you've got to put the focus of your mind in check. Mm -hmm. Because if you are not careful, the spirit of your mind can lead you away from the light that shines from the glory of Jesus Christ. And if that happens, you won't be able to serve God. That day will be a wash for you. 
Now, I'm glad God's been merciful. I've had some wash days. It's a source of shame. It's a burden. That, that you've learned how to compartmentalize spiritual life. Have that little five-minute ditty in the morning, that devotion they call it. And then go about your day without being conscious of God. That's dangerous. It's dangerous to attempt to do anything you do without God being in your consciousness. And Jesus is responsible for making sure that doesn't happen to people that are walking by faith in Christ. You cannot have your mind and heart focused upon Jesus and God step into the background of your thinking in anything you do. That's why you don't do anything you do unless you do it as unto the Lord or you're going to grow dull in the process. Very dangerous. He is the light. He is the light. There are so many other details in here, but I'm just going to say a few more things. I hope you're seeing what I'm saying generally. If you were going to step beyond that holy place into the holiest place, you had to first go through a veil. You may recall that when Jesus died, that was one of the things that was noted by the Spirit. The veil was rent from top to bottom. And then Paul makes this note. And I'm glad for the Apostle Paul. I know that he was led by the Spirit, but Paul was involved in it. <laughs> he was involved in it. I know he was given understanding, but see, he received it. And the Apostle Paul gave this word. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. What a good word. What a good word. Which means, like Jesus said, remember he said his body was broken mm -hmm. for us. Broken for us. Which means if his body hadn't been broken, the veil would still be shut up. Yeah. None of us would get in. None of us would get in. See? But you come through a living way. That's not how we were taught, brother. That's not how we were taught. Yeah. We were taught to come by some lifeless dead routine rather than coming through a man. Mm. That's right. But you come... Through the flesh of Jesus. Amen. Through it being broken. See? Which is a marvelous depiction of, of his death. You get in there, and especially on the day of atonement, these certain things that were, that were taking place inside that holiest place, which represented, like, which represented the, the communion of God. Remember he told Moses that he would commune with him over the mercy seat between the cherubs. And that just happened to be the very place that the high priest came into on the Day of Atonement, not without blood, mm -hmm. which he offered for himself and also for, for the others. If you get into that place, and there are a couple of very significant things that are in there, you would see the altar of incense. Someone actually made mention of this. It seemed like Friday night this was made mention of God, pleased, God being pleased with you. But that is so essential. If you're going to walk in fellowship with God, God has got to be pleased with you now. Yeah. Now. That's what that altar was about. That wasn't for that wasn't for Aaron. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it did have a sweet aroma for Aaron, but that wasn't for his satisfaction at all. Mm -hmm. That was for God. Mm -hmm. That's why you couldn't take the, the incense out and kind of use it for yourself. It wasn't for you. It was for God. You remember when Noah, when Noah came out of the ark and he offered a sacrifice to God? The scripture says that it was a soothing aroma. Remember, we're, we're just on the heels of the divine wrath being yeah. broke out in the world. Mm. Brethren, God's not going to be angry all the ways. Mm -hmm. Amen. This is not like a premier quality of God is being angry. Mm -hmm. God was glad for the soothing aroma. Mm -hmm. And methinks that when he smelled that aroma, he was smelling yeah. somebody else. Amen. And he was thinking about somebody else, and it wasn't me, and it wasn't you. Mm -hmm. It was his son. Amen. It was his son. Because there is nobody mm -hmm. that has pleased God mm -hmm. with regards to you like Jesus has. Amen. Amen. In fact, in Ephesians 1, he says that we are accepted mm -hmm. in the beloved. That's right. We are predestined unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto himself. Why? Because what Jesus has done in salvation has pleased God. Yeah, amen. It has pleased him. Amen. And thus he is, he's accepting of us. Eh? Well, that's gospel. And that is the way it is. Okay? 
a couple more thoughts. You see also the Ark of the Covenant. And I'm not going to say much about this because this is something, Brother Gibbon, I'm very thankful that you're going through this because this has been such a blessing. This, the necessity of covenant, mm -hmm. the Ark of the Covenant, right there in the holiest place. Mm -hmm. How essential that is. And this is something that's kind of new to me, so I'm just going to say something and move right on. Okay? But I'm very thankful for this. This series has been wonderful. Mm -hmm. That if you're going to come to God, you have to come by means of a covenant. Yeah. I'm sorry, God doesn't have just a, a personal, just a, such a lovey-dovey relationship with humanity that they can just come to him anyway. Uh -huh. mm -mm. Yeah. No. You come to God, you come by a covenant, mm -hmm. or you don't get there. You don't get there. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. Yeah. Okay? And that's what we have. I love it when, G when, when the Father speaks to the Son. I love those texts. Those are just marvelous. And he says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and will give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light to the Gentiles. Don't miss what's being said after that. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. So what does that mean? It means Jesus is the guarantee that everything God has said that has to do with promises relating to this covenant, Jesus is the guarantee that that is going to happen. Yeah. You are not the guarantee. Amen. Otherwise, it couldn't be by grace, and it wouldn't be sure to the heirs. Yeah. It wouldn't be sure. Yeah. It's sure by Jesus. Amen. He is the surety of Amen. the covenant. And if you continue to walk by faith in him, every single promise that God has declared in this covenant is going to come to pass. Well, that's, that's wonderful to see. That's, that's, like put me, that's like put me in a place where there's like more stability and confidence. If you're not careful, you get kind of, you get kind of wrapped up in your own circumstance and, and your own service to God. And you think about that, but while you're doing that, your confidence is bleeding out. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. This kind of view that's, that's, be, that's being ministered to us right now from the Lord through Brother Given, mm -hmm. this is priceless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we haven't heard this before, but it's like we're, it's like we're enlarging on our understanding of this. The, the importance of a covenant. Brother Jason's been doing this too, and I'm thankful for both of you. I know you're humble, but I like to give credit where God, where God has worked through men. You've, you've done a wonderful work, and we, we, we believe through the wonderful words that you've spoken as well as others. A covenant. We commune with God through a covenant, and Jesus is the covenant. He is the covenant. One last thing is that mercy seat that sat over that covenant box. This is the truth that, that the Lord has been showing me more too. That if you're going to walk with God, mercy is necessary yeah. to sustain that fellowship. Yeah. Mercy does not necessarily presuppose sin as much as it presupposes need. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, the reason why I say that is because a lot of people, when they think of mercy, they're only thinking about someone getting out of gross iniquity uh -huh. yeah. and sin. And, and that is true. That, that, that is true. I'm just enlarging on this. Mm -hmm. That is true. In fact, the Word of God very, very readily says... Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, yeah. he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. yeah. See, but the thing is, is not everyone that's been saved from sin was involved in gross iniquity. Yeah. <laughs> that's not the way, that's not true. Not everybody's been immoral. I mean, think about like Elizabeth and Zechariah. Hmm? But they still had to be saved. But any time there is a need in relation to salvation, there will be a need for mercy from God. Yeah. Amen. It's God's gentle inclination yeah. that although he himself is never weary, he ne he ne there is no, there's never a decline in his strength in any way. Nothing like that. There's no shortness in his understanding. Those are searching of his understanding. Nothing like this. And yet there are all those things in us. And as long as there are, we have need. But Jesus is the guarantee of the supply of mercy to us. He is not preeminently looking on us when he is extending mercy. We are not the primary motive for his mercy. First off, his own inclination to be merciful is his motive. I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. He gives mercy because he wants to. And because Jesus has made it right for him to do it. Uh -huh. And so the blood was sprinkled yeah. on the mercy seat. Now here's generally what I'm saying. 
Jesus is every one of those things. And we are none of them. He's all of it. He is the entire system wrapped up in one man. Okay, so now just think of that when you hear these words. I am the way, the truth, the life. Mm -hmm. And no man cometh to the Father mm -hmm. but by me. One more thing and I'm done. Notice he didn't say, now I'll give you life and I'll show you the way. Notice he didn't say that. He said, I am that. Mm -hmm. I am that. And, and this is something that's growing on me, too. But here's something that's so wonderful about that, is that all the things that Jesus is becomes beneficial to us as we are walking in fellowship with him. That's where those things are realized. He is all that. He is that. It isn't just that he'll supply it. He is that. And so everything we need for life and godliness is supplied through our knowledge of him. You will never lack anything as you're walking in fellowship with Jesus Christ because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh -huh. And so you can look back to your past. You can see the reconciliation that's taken place, and you can say it was the Lord. It was uh -huh. Jesus. And you can see presently how you are walking in fellowship with the Father, and you're growing in that fellowship. And in your stewardship before the Lord, all those things are on the increase. Why? Because he's the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. And as we, as we set our eyes upon the future, like you talked about this morning, Brother Jason, this is the thing that gives encouragement and hope. Uh -huh. Because we are going to come to the Father by one, yes. Jesus Christ. There's a day coming that Jesus is going to present all the children who have put their trust in him, who have not allowed that sincere devotion that Sister Eva talked about, not allowed for that sincere devotion, something to get between. Mm -hmm. Walk by faith in Christ Jesus, and Jesus is going to say to the Father, I am the Father, I am the children which thou hast given me. He's the guarantee of coming to God, no matter what aspect you're looking at. And so I, I just encourage you, and I'm leaving leave plenty of room for Jason. Keep your eyes on the Son of God, because he is the one bringing us to the Father. Thank you. Amen.